Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I have Lisa Wimberger with us. She is amazing. She set up a company called NeuroSculpting. Um, it's all about being able to change your thought patterns and navigate a life you desire. She has courses online that you can take. I'm signing up for them, so feel free to join me in that curriculum. And then also has written how many books? Seven. Seven. I'm writing a book. It's a lot of work. So yeah, work. an author of seven books and has just this wonderful gift to share with the world. Um, like myself who had a life altering accident, she did as well. So let's get into like 15 years old and struck by lightning. Yes. Okay. I would have been struck by lightning. So I want to hear like, how bad were you struck by lightning? Okay. So the side of the house got, I was leaning up against the garage door handle side of the garage got hit the lightning came out the handle came out the base of my spine so i would say that was an indirect hit but it exited through me um and a, a bunch of friends were with me they they watched me and the boy next to me who was touching my shoulder we both catapulted off the garage door and landed like four feet away face first in the dirt completely unaware of what happened except all of our friends were in a circle around us with their mouths open saying, you got hit, you got hit, you flew. And really, I, I didn't believe them. All I, all I perceived was something threw me hard. I thought it was the boy next to me. I thought he hit me in the, it felt like I was punched in the back. I, I was disoriented, but I was conscious. So I, I didn't actually buy the story yet. Um, until we got home to the house, it, we were all wet. It was a rainstorm. We got home to my friend's house and my watch was stopped. And I was like, oh, maybe I did get hit. I don't know. And then probably that week I started having uh, what I thought were fainting spells. They turned out to be progressively worsening seizures that the lightning sort of got my nervous system really trigger happy and took a natural response I had to stress, which was like a paralysis freeze response and it exacerbated it with the lightning strike. And so now I start having seizures like shortly after the lightning strike and they got real bad for a really long time. Yeah, like 20 years or something. Yeah, I mean, I didn't get a diagnosis till I was in my early 30s. So I had already been having them for about 15 years. Um, not as frequently as an epileptic would have seizures because I wasn't epileptic. I mean, I had brain scans and there was like nothing wrong with me. But I would have seizures like a few times a year and they would be paralysis. They'd be grand mal seizures, which I didn't get diagnosed till I was in my early 30s but I'd be having grand mal seizures, my heart would stop, I would go blue, uh, get cyanosis, and uh, be completely unable to recuperate well. It took sometimes 24 hours in bed to be able to move again. Um, but in my, the gift of my diagnosis was like the worst possible place you could ever have a seizure. I was, I was in a gyno exam. Oh, and, um, oh. All I remember is, you know, th my wonderful gynecologist at the time, who was this really old man. Um, Sorry. You know, I, I just remember it's seeing seeing uh, his face like above the sheet and my legs are in the stirrups and I feel like I'm going to faint. He's doing a cervical exam and um, lo and behold, I wake up to a needle of atropine in his hand he's shaking and he's going to inject me in my heart he's going to resuscitate me with atropine uh, which is very jarring uh, thankfully he didn't because i had i opened my eyes and he told me i had flatlined he told me i had a grand mal seizure i had flatlined i couldn't speak i was in a puddle like i this is this was normal for me i would wake up like this on the floor somewhere and when he found out that this had been happening to me for 15 years, you know, he said, well, we, they ruled out epilepsy, did all the tests and said I was, I had a uh, hyperactive vagus nerve and I was having grand mal seizures based on stress. And that was, 
that was the gift that I needed, right? I needed to know what this was so I could start realizing, well, I have control over how I respond to stress. And so that was like light bulb number one. Yeah, when we can label something, right? It's Absolutely. so amazing how much power a label gives us. Now it has, it's contained, yeah. almost, I find. It's and a manageable thing. It has a, a form and it, you can research it and you can relate to it. Yeah. yeah. Now you froze. When people have the response of fight, flight, or freeze, do they normally have one that they always go to or can it vary? It can vary from situation to situation, but we tend to develop automated habituated patterns for our stress responses. So we tend to default to maybe one more than the other, but again, it is completely situational where, where sometimes we'll move into agitated fight flee. And if we have okay processing, we can discharge that. But sometimes that move towards agitation, if it cannot be discharged and it becomes overwhelming, then we can put the brakes on it and then go from agitation to freeze. So we can go right from stress to freeze or through agitation and then back to freeze. Um, so it's really a spectrum versus a, a label. an either or. Okay. Um, but they're different animals. They're really, they're very different in the body. They're diff they need different things mm -hmm. for recuperation. And, um, if you don't know what they need and you don't, don't know which response you're engaging in, then you don't have the power to intervene because you have no information. So I really feel like we're lacking in education around our own mammalian nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing a disservice to everybody, every human out there who grows up knowing nothing about their nervous system. We've done a disservice to them. And, and I feel like education should be about how to be the best human and mammal on the planet, right? And we don't, I mean, do you even know where your stomach is? I took my daughter to the cadaver visit exhibit when she was like five and she's like, mom, what's that? And it was this thing way up high. And I'm thinking, I don't know what that is. And turns out it was the stomach. And she said, well, if the stomach's all the way up there, why do I put my hand down here when I say I have a belly ache? And my mind was blown. Like, right. I don't even know where my stomach is. And I'm carrying it around with me all the time. We don't know anything about our bodies generally speaking. And if we knew a little bit more, we could have agency over this body. Like you probably took agent, like you take agency all the time to push yourself, to optimize yourself, to, to summit, right? You have to take agency over your body. And you, you know what that feels like. You know the power that brings you. You know the potential that is available to you when you know how to work this instrument and you can accomplish things that very few people can. And that's the power of knowing just a little bit about the nervous system. Yeah, the nervous system's fascinating to me. We've like just learned little, I was in a car accident and the interesting thing for my car accident was the minute I got hit by the semi, I knew that instant that I wasn't gonna die. I didn't know anything else, but like for some reason I got that download, like you're not gonna die. And I remember being able to dilate that accident and mm. saying, okay, we need to keep our hands on the steering wheel so my arms don't get out of the car. I need to breathe and roll with the car, not resist it, because if you roll with, you're not going to have an injury. And I remember we, I went, you know, end over three times and then ended up sideways in the median. And that's when sound and life started returning again. Right. So you start and then all of a sudden someone said, like, are you OK? Are you OK? And I just remember that voice getting louder and louder and feeling more realistic. And then I realized he was talking to me. And I said, is there anybody else in this accident? He said, no, there's not. But you're the only one that's going to be hurt. I'm like, OK. And I didn't even dare look at my body at this point because it just nothing made sense to me yet. And I remember closing my eyes and wiggling my fingers and toes and saying, I can feel my fingers and toes. I'm going to be okay. Wow. And now like every time I'm on the mountain, anytime I get overwhelmed, 
I just close my eyes and I use that trick. I can feel my fingers and toes. I'm yeah. okay, right? Like whatever story is being written or whatever is going on up here, let's just get back to what my body's telling me. My body yeah, telling you, me- You got embodied, right? You got embodied, which takes you into the present moment. So when you are on that mountain and the stories are playing out, that's not actually helpful, but getting embodied into the present moment is. And you know, you said something interesting. There's this fascinating thing in trauma where not just trauma, but also flow state where time slows down. We can dilate, like you said, time in those spaces of pure presence. And, you know, Einstein already showed us that time is relative, right? It can change its pace based on light and space. So why not perception too? Why can't perception change time? And it does, right? When you're purely present, you can dilate time and inside that dilation is, it's almost like the matrix. There's this gift of knowing, of flow state, of moving with and having the time to know what to do and how to adjust. And it's fascinating to me because then things start to pixelate. And like you said, you know, you, you, the voices brought reality back uh, or the voices, you know, sped up time again. Right, 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 right. No, once you learn how to access that, it is a superpower. It is a superpower. <laughs> and I imagine, now you didn't summit before this. No, so I was in finance and raising kids and doing that whole story of the next level I'll achieve, the next level I'll get there, then, you know, that if then type of thing. And after that car accident, it, it was a game changer. I'm like, nope, I am. I was saved. I, we write a story. My story was there's no logical sense that I survived. They rebuilt that accident 50 different times and they could not build one scenario where I lived. Like not, yeah. he's like, I can't even build one where you're alive, let alone not dismembered and everything else. And you come out of that experience saying, okay, I'm here for a reason, enough of the noise, enough of the opinions, whatever. And then you just start feel like things summon us, they come to us, right? And I was got on the path of, I was climbing a mountain for my 40th birthday because I wanted to do something to celebrate that. And it was a mountain called Ama de Blom in Nepal. And my son called it, I'm a dumb blonde because he didn't make, you know, he's young. He's like, I don't know what this is. And so then when we were teasing him about homework, I'm like, hey buddy, we do hard things. We got this. He looks me straight faced. If we do hard things, why aren't you climbing Mount Everest? like a real mountain. And so then I'm like, you know what, do your homework and we'll talk about it. And we talked about it. And then I got, when they went to bed, I was still researching it. And then I got involved in it. And then my coach handed me a book and he said, Hey, here's something to study. And when I was reading that book, someone had gotten a Guinness world record. And I just remember thinking my kids learned how to read on Guinness world record books, like how many hot dogs someone ate or like, yes, you know, all the things yes. that kids care about. I was half joking. I said, Hey, listen, if I got a Guinness world record, my kids would think I'm cool. And he's like, I'll find you one. And then he came up with the seven second summits because they hadn't been done by a female before. I mm -hmm. love to travel. Um, and it was just a platform to say, Hey, you can be a mom and a business owner and still have your own desires. And actually the more you do you, the better off everybody is yes. around you because it just ripple effects. Yes. Do you know Devin Levick? No. I need to introduce you. He's a friend yeah. of mine and he's summiting the seven summits. Okay. The uh, first seven. Yeah. Awesome. He's, he's attempting that. Um, but he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the New York marathon. He bear crawled it. Didn't oh stand God. up once. 20, like 26 miles or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's insanity. Um, but I have to, I have to get you to yes, I want talking. To yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it's interesting because when you talk about your seizures, you are not, I mean, it's like you went to another, it's not like you checked out. It's almost, you went to another place. And I did go to another place because what's interesting about the seizure world is that there is consciousness happening. It's just not the consciousness you were previously in while you were awake, I'm putting in quotes here, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
I would seize, but I would be perceiving that I was doing something else. And then when that perception, perception started to pixelate, that's when the realization came that, oh my God, I must be in a seizure right now because things would morph. Like, so for instance, um, I always had this, this consciousness happening in, during seizure, but the worst one I ever, uh, one of the worst ones I had was in a food court in front of my daughter. She was about three. And um, I could feel the seizure coming on. It, it, it's a fraction of a second. I could feel it coming on. I had bitten into a chicken bone and jarred myself and I could feel this seizure ex feeling coming. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I, I remember, this is what I remember. I, I touched my tooth. I could taste the blood going down my throat. My tooth was loose. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my tooth. I grabbed my daughter out of the high chair, grabbed her, walked down the hall of the Whole Foods to the bathroom. I'm looking in the mirror. I see my daughter in the periphery. I'm looking at my tooth. I'm going, scrolling through the Rolodex in my head of what dentist, what's the number of the dentist. And that's when I open my eyes to paramedics. And I realize I'm not in the bathroom. I never made it out of my chair. I'm, I bit into a chicken bone and had a seizure and I crashed into the plate of food and flipped over backwards. And none of that reality had played out, but it's the reality I remember to this day. Viscerally, I remember the taste of blood. I remember the way my daughter's hand felt in mine. I remember looking at her in the mirror making sure she was holding my hand and none of that happened. So there's this alternate consciousness where, I mean, technically I was flatlined because I wasn't breathing and I couldn't get a heart going, heartbeat, but I'm completely playing out a reality of sorts. And it happens to be every seizure I've ever had, the memories during the seizure are the things I remember about the event and none of them ever really happen. Wow. I'm usually just on the ground. But, you know, in, in one instance, I was singing on a stage on, in a spotlight, and then I heard a voice saying, you know, breathe, breathe, and I'm thinking, you're interrupting my song. And then, then the reality starts pixelating, and it's the doctor telling me to breathe, and just all this alternate reality playing out, and strange how it embeds itself into your memory as though it were real because I, I suppose if you were to open the brain of anybody and look at what we perceive as memories uh, we already know that a good portion of those are fiction they're made up mm -hmm. and even the ones that really happened we um adapt those memories every time we remember oh, them uh, yeah, yeah. like we're remembering we're taking the pieces and we're re membering them into a whole and that usually comes with gaps each time and so we fill in those gaps with a narrative that makes sense so every recall and it's a new sense, version right and it makes sense in the moment that we're in yes right? so like a word negative right now and recalling a memory from what i've read you're going to now rewrite that memory with a more negative tone yes. and if you're in a positive tone which then can cause it to keep continuing yeah, because you're weaving that fiction suturing off the experience you are having in present time. So memories are completely fallible. And I know this is a hard pill for everyone to sm swallow because we all want to believe that the history of our life is just as we remember it. But neurologically, it's not even close to reality as we define reality as this is what happened. It, it's not. And so, I don't know, it's all this really interesting fabrication based loosely on truths. Yeah. And that's who we think we are. <laughs> right, which is so freeing on one level because we have so much space to create and rewrite and pivot if we desire, but we have to take that break or that stop or that intersection and say, wait, 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 I want yeah. this to be different, which you somehow figured out how to do because this seizure thing that you had forever, you figured out in that space before you tipped, you yeah. had control if you, yeah. so explain this. Yeah, so, so the seizures were getting to the point where I couldn't, usually after a grand mal seizure, you will recalibrate on your own. Your heart will start, your breathing will kick in after X amount of seconds. 
But the more you seize in this freeze way, the longer it takes for you to recuperate until eventually you get so good at playing dead, you're actually dead. I was to the point where I couldn't kickstart breathing again autonomically. So the last seizure I had, I had to, my chest had to be like compressed and pushed multiple times for me to maintain breathing. So I knew it was at this point of, if I have another seizure by myself, because I hadn't been by myself the last few, if I have one by myself, I'm going to die. And I have a little kid in the crib upstairs and oh, I better figure this out. So I was studying neuroscience already and I was learning all about our capacity to uh, create new habits, to entrain and habituate. I was learning the rules of neuroplasticity and I was like, look, if this is not epilepsy, which it wasn't, then this is a response pattern and I can intervene. It's an autonomic response, which makes it that much harder, but still there must be a window of time mm -hmm. where I can choose option B if I had an option B. So what I did was I needed to create an option B and I had to rehearse it until it was a viable option in the moment. And right. it wasn't gonna be an option in the moment right away. Right, because it's a dirt road. If you Correct. look at it as like, hey, I'm building this, it's a dirt road. Until that road gets paved like a super highway, your body's not going to pick that option because it's more effort. Absolutely. So I thought to myself, okay, what could I do to put these rehearsal scripts, creating option B, what could I do to put them on steroids so that my body just like, whoa, grabs it? And I was like, well, there are rules to neuroplasticity. I can entrain my nervous system to believe something faster, better, stronger, with higher recall, if I actually recruit focused attention while in non-sleep deep rest, while engaging both hemispheres of my brain, and I can embed something very potently with that container. And that's what I was learning with neuroscience. So what I did was I sequenced a meditation format that each layer of prompting, mental prompting, would first bring me to non-sleep deep rest through quieting my midbrain. Second, would recruit focused attention by activating the front of the brain. And that combination is a neuroplasticity platform for your nervous system. And then I needed to recruit bilateral stimulation to really engage and up the value of the rehearsal story um, because we are extra neuroplastic when we bilaterally stimulate. So the rehearsal story was in that window of time where a seizure halo comes and I have that the one second to go, uh, you know, I'm going to dilate that time like you did in a rehearsal script. And then I'm going to act out the opposite of seize. And the opposite was punching, kicking, screaming, fighting. And so I literally induced my brain in those first few sequences and then rehearsed after I induced myself, I rehearsed what I was going to do in that seizure halo. And um, I didn't know if it would work. I also embedded it in my body and I linked it to hand gestures like you did. You know touching your fingers means you're okay. So I was linking it to hand gestures for a somatic anchor. Um, and I rehearsed this for about seven, eight months in meditation, thinking, I don't know when another seizure is going to come, but this is all I can do right now. And about eight months later, after my worst seizure, a, a halo came. I was in the car. I don't remember. I thought I was the passenger. My husband said I was driving. Um, so I don't remember driving. But I was driving, and a wave came. And I could feel myself think, I'm going to die. And I went into that, uh, that, that grunt that I would make at a halo, and all of a sudden, option B kicked in. The rehearsal script kicked in, because I had rehearsed it for eight months, and I, I swerved the car and I started punching and kicking and screaming and smashing the dashboard. I wasn't even aware of what I was doing. He grabbed the wheel. I'm now in the middle of the road ripping stuff out of the car like this banshee, 
completely unhinged. And then after that, my whole body starts tremoring, like shaking. And he takes me home and he puts me in a, I said, put me in a dark room. And I just sat in a dark room, like shaking, like <laughs> like that um, for hours. And when I was done shaking, my bones felt different. My cells felt different. It's like you said you knew you weren't going to die. I knew I was done. I just knew. In my bones, I'm never going to have another seizure again. I did it. And so it was the first seizure I interrupted. Option B had been entrained. It had been habituated. And it kicked in as my most recallable script. That's amazing. And once I realized I actually habituated a new autonomic response, I went, oh, oh my God, this is, a, this is a superhero gift. Like any human can do this. How much of what we carry, whether it's a physical disease, an emotional disease, a mental dysregulation, whatever, how much of that is habituated story or patterning or right? patterning like, right i mean yeah this brings up a, do, have you had any experience with ketamine or anybody that has i have clients who have yes okay so i have a son my third oldest who had a motor tick and he was struggling with that tick we would do all these different sitting with the frog meditations and things like that and then one of the doctors said you should consider a ketamine treatment Mm. So I called the ketamine place and they're like, well, we don't deal with kids that young, da, 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 da. And I said, okay, please. And they, so they did the lightest dose possible. And we were in this room and he was like, I was swimming with sharks and whales. And I got to see, cause he's a big underwater kid. He was like, I got to see all these things and do all this stuff. Never had a tick again. It is amazing. So I work with quadriplegics and we've gotten them to move paralyzed limbs after over a decade of paralysis. And that's not to say everything is a story or a pattern, but so much is and we don't know how much is until we actually unwind them and the capacity and the potential to heal and rebalance and overcome and rehabituate to something better is absolutely unlimited. It's unlimited and it's a superpower. And if I could figure it out with a few neuroscience certifications, I don't even have a degree in neuroscience, but if I could figure this out and for the last 16 years, bring it to people who are getting movement back in, in spinal sever injuries and, and getting off uh, heroin cold turkey and stopping seizures and, and rebalancing emotional dysregulation and overcoming chronic mold and Lyme and all these crazy stories of what happens when you repattern the nervous system, then I think everyone in the world should just have this tool. It's a 15 minute practice. It's ridiculously simple. Um, and it's really just speaking the language the nervous system wants you to speak in order to get it to do what you want it to do. It's like when you're raising kids, you can speak to them in a way that they understand and you're going to get them to do what you need them to do faster. The nervous system is the same thing. Wow. So how long, so you practiced, so you've made this script for everybody now, right? I mean, you have the different courses online, the beginner, yeah. the intermediate and the advanced, and you can yeah. come a practitioner. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so the everyday course is a 15 minute meditation, but you also make custom ones too. Yes. Right? So the heart of the practice is a 15 minute meditation okay. that, um, that you do. And then of course that meditation, the content changes based on what you want to work on, but the framework is there. Um, in the courses, we teach you how to use the framework for any topic. We teach you the magic behind the framework. We teach you the neuroscience of why it works. And then we also give you a ton of education and, and somatic practices and nutrition and daily practices that you can use to actually condition your nervous system. So it's not just the, the neurosculpting meditation. It's a whole course in how do I befriend my nervous system and how do I take agency over it? And a lot of that is also just really good, solid, neuroscience and um, 
polyvagal theory and just understanding how to condition your mammalian guitar strings so the music you play in your body is beautiful. Um, and so the coursework takes people deeper and deeper. So like the, the first course online is gonna be, I think it's about a six hour total with meditation downloads and worksheets and lots of learning. Um, and that's gonna get someone using the tools and with a library of meditations to choose from that they can use for different aspects of repatterning. The intermediate's gonna get people self-sufficient. So not only are they using the meditations that that we gave you but now you're starting to say oh wait i can actually derive a brand new meditation for this particular pattern of mine and it's not something i was ever taught it's just what i can now do because i know the form mm -hmm. um and then the ad advanced class is going to get you to understand the subtle interpersonal dynamics that dysregulate us in relationship and you can actually repattern and show up differently in relationship which ultimately can change relationships um, is because we regulate and co-regulate and dysregulate inside relationships and that all affects the nervous system so the courses are really robust and it's designed to get you to never need me mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. you know and that's not to say external support isn't important. Everyone needs external support. It's part of how we're wired. But everyone also needs a lot more internal agency. Yeah, the, knowing that the power is within. Yeah, absolutely. And that's my goal is to give people as much internal agency as possible to unlock the hope that you can shift and you can do it regardless of your resources. And then from there, the external resources and supports that you go to amplify your agency. They don't further disempower you and make you codependent. I like that. Yeah. Awesome. We did a thing at our house. I have seven children, so it can get pretty crazy. That's and <laughs> alone without even summiting mountains. That is incredible to me. It's a mountain in and of itself. I mean, the level even... of respect I have for you is incredible. <laughs> it's funny. It's fun, right? I mean, it's just all I, I have um, just fun watching people be themselves and figuring out who they are and testing out different theories that they come up with and just watching life sculpt them into their little young beings. But my I, funny, I have twins. So the twins or fighters, right? Like more so than the others. I don't know if that's the twin dynamic or whatever. So we read somewhere that you either had to have open hands or you had to be lying down on the ground and then try to fight. And when you sit here and try to fight with your hands open, cause like fighting is this Yeah, Cause you need to movement. contract. You have to you, contract. You have to contract, right? So I'm like, oh, you moved. You have to lay on the floor and get mad at your sister. And they would end up in giggling spells, right? I mean, it was just so funny because like, no, now we're not gonna be able to fight mom. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Open the hands. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah it yeah, makes no, so much sense. I know it's so funny. It's like the little things that when you all sudden think, I mean, we just do stuff we don't know. Right. And then you think about it and you're like, oh, wow, it really is hard to get angry and fight you when I can't put my hands into a like crunch them. What do you think your kids? Let me let me rephrase that. How do you think your kids experience you now versus how they might have experienced you before the accident? Yeah, good. Um, think they have like I was. They have an, an inspired mom, mm. right? I I was so by the rules or just A equals B equals C equals D, and I was on the serious side of personalities, and that is still my default mode. Mm. But I have to be like now. I'm way more playful and exploratory and less rigid, and I do feel when I'm chasing a goal and we're, we're living parallel lives, right? I have to do things I don't want to do. They have to do things they don't want to do. I don't always succeed on the mountains that I try. We have to come back. They're not always going to succeed. It. It's just been fun because so much of what I'm doing, they're doing. And I, my stuff's visible where before, if you were in finance, mm. you don't really have something visible to take home and talk about, mm. or I didn't have language for it for them to understand. 
And now I can be, yeah, I don't want to go train today either, but I have to, or I don't want to yeah. eat healthy, but if I don't, then my whole mood goes like this for the rest of the day. Yeah. How do you balance it? Um, strategically, like I'm a planner at heart, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's my core of my being. So on Sundays, this is going to sound so, you know, but on Sundays I will look at the calendar for the week and then I put the kids in first still, I should probably put me in first, but I do put the kids in first and then I'll put my training in and work in around that. And a lot of times I'll be the mom on the soccer field that's doing, I'll bring a 12 inch step. I'll be doing step ups while I'm watching a soccer game, right? So that I can do that with them. Or if I'm training in the basement, I'll have, I have like a little trampoline and stuff like that down there. So they can ask me questions or do homework while I'm doing that. And they just know that mom's a busybody. It's a mm -hmm. lot of batching, batching yeah. activities to make it worthwhile and work. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a nice system going. Yeah. I have a lot of support. Uh, so our nanny, I used to nanny for. So she's been with us the entire time. She's weak tease. She's the real mom. <laughs> like she does all the serious mom stuff. I do all the fun mom stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of behind the scenes that goes on in a household. Yeah. I mean, I only have one and seven. Wow. Yeah. 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 But it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. So with the um, 15 minutes a day, do you recommend it in the morning or the afternoon? Or is there a time that works better for people? You know, I mean, I suppose if you wanted to get nitty gritty and find out when is plasticity at its peak, I would say that you could get really regimented and map it to attention cycles. And where do you feel most attentive? And that might be morning, you know, that might not be at the end of an exhausting day. But what I find works better is to say, where does it fit in my busy life? Mm -hmm. And that's where it belongs because that's where it's gonna be the most easeful for you to reach for it. And the, the, the key to neuroplasticity is repetition, efficiency, repetition, and focus. And we don't wanna make things harder than they need to be. I don't need you to meditate for an hour on the mountaintop and reach Zen, right? Which I don't even know if you can in an hour. So I don't need you to do the hard stuff. I need you to do the efficient stuff, which is usually like you do, batching, right? So we consolidate the meditation into 15 minutes. We follow this formula. It is potent. It is strategic. It is laser targeted. And it's not for you to reach bliss. Um, so when I say meditation, I think people think, oh, this is going to relax me. This is going to help me get blissed out not really neuro neuroplasticity practices are not designed for bliss. They're not designed for alpha brainwave state. They're designed for recruited focused attention combined with alpha state. So we don't need you to be totally relaxed. We need you to be somewhat engaged. So I don't need you to do it for an hour. It's a beautiful thing to just go in with strategy 15 minutes a day, if you can do it every day, fantastic. If not, then three times a week is great. In fact, we just had a study published in the, in the Journal of Yoga Rehabilitation and Physical Therapy. Uh, it was an 11 week neurosculpting study and it showed that one hour a week, cumulative, which I would say is you know, three times a week of a 15 minute meditation or four times, um, increased sleep, decreased anxiety, improved resting heart rate and heart rate variability. And that's not a lot of time. So we're talking about you putting it in your schedule where it's manageable and doing it as many times as is manageable. Yeah, it's so easy, it's hard. Right? Yeah, Man, absolutely, absolutely. Being simple is difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, like our minds tell us, it's not hard. It's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, well, we there's that, that silly phrase, right? No pain, no gain. Who so, made that up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wh who's that serving? Tell yeah. me that right now, please. Out of all the options of things you could say to motivate me, the first person to say something motivational was no pain, no gain. Like, why would you choose that? I know it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it's funny when I climb the mountains, um, it's a moving meditation, right? I'm in it these has to be for you to do it. Yeah, you're in these extreme environments, but there's such 
the calm to the disorder. There's such a, it's such a dichotomy of experiences that there's just rhythm to be found in going one, two, one. Because you don't have to do anything else in that moment. There is nothing lingering to do, but be right where you are. That's a gift. Like there's your to-do list does not matter or exist. Social media doesn't matter or exist. Uh, nothing does except can you put your foot safely in front of the other one and yep. breathe and stay upright. Yep. That's, that's it. power. That's powerful. Oh, it's so addicting. <laughs> I mean, that's why. Wow. How do many it. summits have you done? I have five out of my goals. So I have two left. And it's funny because about a year ago, I was on Mount Logan. So May of 2020, no, sorry, just recently, May of 2022, I was on Mount Logan and we didn't summit. We were two days from summiting and the weather was too bad, not safe to continue. So we stopped the expedition and I was so angry and furious and just, I don't want to invest another May on this mountain and blah, 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 blah. And then one of my friends said to me, it's like, you're going to miss this when it's gone. Like you're going to miss these moments because it's going to be done. Like, you know, wow. it's going to be done. And when he said that, that just, sh I helped him sail a sailboat before. So I remember like going from Florida to California through the Panama canal and being like, this is the most epic adventure. And then you're right. It's done. So then I just remembered, I'm like, this is going to be done. I have to take in all of it as much you know it's like when you have a new baby and you just want to eat them right like mm, you want to take in mm. every piece of it because it is that these moments are gonna be gone yeah and how special that you get to have that you you already know this but how few people get to have the magnitude of that experience that does this simultaneous thing of putting you on top of the world to know you can do anything and making you so small and irrelevant that you realize you don't matter at the same time. Yeah, right. It's like extremes all in one moment. And you're just like, yes. wow, this is so magic. Like life yeah. is such a gift. And I think that's why I love what you do because people just get out of their heads and just remember this is such a gift. And the more we can get into our present moment, the more you like get addicted to that present moment. Absolutely. I like to use the lens of this is not a dress rehearsal. I feel fortunate that I feel like I've had nine lives in this one. I'm sure you feel yes. similar. And at the same time, it, it's not a dress rehearsal. And you can either use those moments of life threat and death or NDE at near death experience, and you can use it to to be afraid of the rest of your life, or you can use it as like this fuel to, to realize I don't have tomorrow guaranteed and nobody does. And it's a complete ridiculous illusion to think that we do, but I'm gonna use that as fuel to be as present as possible, as forgiving, as accepting, as angry, as energized, as quiet, whatever the feeling is that's coming up, I'm going to try to savor it to the best of my capacity because I might not have tomorrow. And right now, this is what my human experience is offering me. Yeah, it's no, fascinating to it me. It's fascinating. I, I can echo that from a, when I got out of my accident and I came home. I wish you could hold on to these feelings forever, but yeah. you don't get to. But I remember two of my kids fighting. And before I would have been. Oh, just stop fighting, like get over it. Right. But after that accident, you just sat there and you're like in awe of the fact that you have two humans so convinced, so charged, so like sure that they're the right way that they're trying to convince the other side to come over. And there's such beauty in that, Like you don't even want to stop it. You just want it to play out and just let it be because it's magic. It's magic. The whole human spectrum, I think, and this is this makes me think of the whole like self-help world, which obviously I'm a part of, but th there's, a, there's a gaping hole in that world, which is this illusion of that you have to be 
um, balanced and you have to be um, always forgiving and you have to, you know, namaste your way through things and you have to, you know, be above your emotions. And that is, for me, that's very detrimental because that means we're not embodying. And you just defined pure presence as the most embodied state. And so if we want to be embodied, we have to be embodied with what's there. And humans are made to have all of the fire and all of the passion and all of the aggression and the rage as much as all the light and the joy and, and the forgiveness. And if we cut off one because it's you know beneath us as evolved humans, we are not going to be embodied. We absolutely will prevent ourselves from, be, from being present. And that's a shame. And so I love that you're kind of, you witness that in your kids and you're like, you're just amazing, crazy humans being amazing, crazy humans and not trying to be anything else. Right, right. Like, why do, where do we, where do we pick that up? Like, why do we do that to ourselves? It just, it's I don't, weird, I don't know, but in, somewhere. but social media is not helping anymore. It's like making it even more difficult to be a messy human. I mean, not everybody, but a lot of it out there is like this curated life that is just not exactly what's going on. It's right. No, I agree. Oh, that's funny. Um, what do you, what do you, okay, so I read a book called The Body Keeps Score. Amen. I'm just going to bow to that yes, book. Yes, right? Yes. Like best book ever. Yeah. Bessel van der Kolk is like the man who helps people understand that they're a human in a body. Yeah. So when I meditate, I will have parts of my body that light up that I think I've shut off. Mm -hmm. right? Because I felt something or whatever. I wasn't capable of being present for whatever was happening at that moment. And the combination of meditating and reading that book just has allowed me to be more. Yeah. In, in neurosculpting in the five embedded in the process is the, uh, we direct you to go find the sensation and the idea or the imagery or the associations in the body for that match or or synchronize with the thoughts and the perceptions. We are always mapping mind to body in the neurosculpting process because we have to honor the work of someone like Bessel van der Kolk who is who understands trauma and and to embody a shift you you can't disconnect from your body. So we are always linking like if there's a thought and a part of your body lights up, whether it's a physical sensation or a mental perception, we're going to spend time there and investigate the association. And then we're gonna use your creative mind or your breath or your body to shift that association or sensation to something more palatable for you. And that's going to embed a new outcome for that prior association. And, and so that's one way that we also start making shifts. This is how I've gotten quadriplegics to move. This is how I've gotten left hemisphere stroke survivors to say words. It is through this idea that um, we have, it, neuroplasticity is time dependent. If I feel something at the same time I'm thinking something, my brain says those two things must go together. They're happening in the same time, time frame. So neuroplasticity honors synchronicity and time as a valuable currency. So in neurosculpting, we bring up sensation as we are bringing up perception, and then we shift one of them at the time we're bringing it up, and, and we start manipulating how we link those things, and we link them in new ways and we do it all in real time based on this mind-body connection. Um, I think I made it cumbersome when I was just explaining it like that, but that's ultimately what we're doing is, is exploring the sensations and the associations in the body and we're shifting them and then we're embedding the shift and then we're remembering the embedded shift and then we're accessing it easier and easier every time. And that's how we rehearse the script to make it a viable option B. So do people look at triggering events that they have in their life and say, hey, here's a triggering event. So when they're into the meditation that you have, 
then they start focusing on that to give them a script B to access? Yes. So okay. you can you can do two things. You can choose to look at a triggering script if you're the kind of person that likes to like get your hands dirty and clean up things. Or you can instead just entrain to a new, better option and cultivate some nice, better pattern without looking at the old script. Depending on the person and their preference, like we, we're not a therapeutic model, so we don't force people to go into their trauma, but people want to, that's their choice. And so for me, I like to do both. I like to like roll up my sleeves and go, I'm gonna work on this thing that triggers me and I remodel it. And then sometimes I don't want to do the heavy lifting. Instead, I want to implant an entrainment script that feels really nice and peaceful. Mm -hmm. And so I'll cultivate it. Same process. It's just the content I'm focusing on is either one of editing or one of cultivating. Oh, I like I, and I do both based on my mood. Sometimes I do both inside of one meditation. Um, but it's really what the user is comfortable with. We don't push people out of their comfort zone. We don't push them towards their trauma. We don't even imply that there needs to be a trauma that even was real. Right, there like just needs need to, to be a pattern. It? Yeah. For well, whatever especially reason. With, I don't think we have language for all of it. No. So then we're just making up a story anyways. Yeah, and then we also try to keep people we, we like to get people to look at the stories and the patterns they have, but to stay out of the therapeutic identification with that story. We leave that to the therapists and we actually work a lot with therapists so that we are like, a, like um, an adjunct piece that therapists can get trained in and use it inside of therapy. But we're really just facilitating this neuroplasticity meditation process. It's fantastic. Yeah. I love it. I'm so excited to get more into it. Yes. I, and it's meditation's been hard for me to do consistently, but it's one of those things where it works and then you stop doing it. Like, I don't know why yeah. that happens, but that's totally what happens to me. Yeah. Look, because when it's so great. And now yes. I want to go back into that pattern of not feeling great again. What? Like, why don't I just push through? <laughs> well, I think sometimes when things don't feel uh, remarkable, we tend to just walk away like when things are copacetic and normal and unremarkable the body wants to orient to some kind of wow right so when you're using a process that makes you normalized balanced and unremarkable your body wants to find a wow that's like going to seek some drama or some kind of state change right so i feel like that that's part of the reason why things get going really good and now everything's balanced and easy and oh i don't feel alive so much yeah. so i don't know it's this interesting dance of body needs to also feel alive so i like the language of that that was good that yeah was yeah. Oh, human. We're so silly. <laughs> we're so silly. We're so messy. We and are then messy. we're, and then the, the craziest thing to me is we're all human. We all know how freaking messy we are and we all pretend we're not. And then we pretend that we're not all aware of everyone else pretending. Why, why do we do that? Oh, it's so funny. I don't get it. I don't need I don't it. get it. And I still do it. Yeah. I'm, par I'm, part still, of the I'm still guilty. Too. Guilty, yeah. guilty is charged. I'm sorry. I'm still going to like make sure my, I don't have chocolate on my face before I go on Instagram. So like, I'm still participating in the whole thing as well, but it's just fascinating to me. It is fascinating. Well, this conversation has been amazing. I yes. so inspired. I love what you bring to the table. What's the best way for people to reach out to you to learn more and all these things? Yeah, neurosculpting.com. Um, contact us, jump into our courses, um, check out our, we have a free giveaway meditation on the meditation page. It's a little sample. Um, follow us on social media, ask us questions, get engaged in our community and our, in our membership and get support from me twice a month in that membership. And I don't know, just start exploring your innate power to unlock and 
harness the fuel of change, which to me is, is hope. That's how I like to say it. I love it. Yay. Well, Yay. thank you so very much. Yes, it was a pleasure. <laughs>